The 7600X is the value proposition from the new Ryzen 7000 series at 300 bucks. Anyone considering it is likely enticed by the single thread performance gains from the Zen 4 CPUs and is therefore probably interested in gaming, but there are plenty of other CPUs that can game out there that don't come with the downsides from the upgrade to AM5, which are mostly the prices. You'll need a new X670 or X670E motherboard, a DDR5 memory kit, and of course, a cooler since AMD didn't include a stock Wraith Stealth unit with the 7600X like they did with the 5600X. But since these new CPUs push temperatures to the limit, often hitting 95C in order to maximize performance, how much will your choice of coolers affect performance? Should you be tacking 100 to 200 bucks for a cooler onto this chip's $300 price tag if you don't want to immediately throw away the extra performance that you clawed your way up to the AM5 platform to get? And how does that affect the overall value proposition of a 7600X build if we are generously attempting to talk ourselves into an upgrade. Today, my goal is to answer all of these questions. Welcome to my review of the AMD Ryzen 5 7600X. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by the new Height Eclipse HG10 wireless gaming headset, combining a clean matte lunar gray color scheme with competition grade functionality, including 2.4 gigahertz wireless connectivity with 30 hour estimated battery life, high fidelity 40 millimeter neodymium drivers, a detachable unidirectional mic, USB type C connectivity with an included 1.8 meter cable to play and charge at the same time, and conveniently accessible controls for power, volume, and mute. For more on the Height Eclipse HG10 headset, click the sponsor link in the video description. So I'd like to dive straight into the extra CPU cooler testing that I did for my 7600X review, but let's quickly get to the crux of my point in today's video. Here is a platform price comparison showing just how much you'd have to pay to get set up with the CPU, memory, and motherboard if you wanted to jump onto the AM5 bandwagon. We're going to see if we can convince ourselves that an extra 300 to 500 bucks is worth it for these parts, especially given how great prices are for last gen right now, which still performs quite well. I'm using PC Part Picker to choose these price points and this is how we can see certain price reductions like the 5600X which is down to 194 and the 12900K which is still pricey at 278. But wow, if you need an AM5 motherboard right now, just look at the starting lowest price at about 250 bucks. There are not even very many that cost less than the 7600X itself. But one thing you're gonna have to pay for with the 7600X, unless you're carrying a cooler over from an older build, is a CPU cooler. And those range a lot, both in price and performance. The CPU cooler that I used for my testing was a Corsair H150i Elite LCD, and that actually retails for $290 right now, although you can find it on sale from time to time. To be clear though, if you're looking at the functional parts of that Corsair cooler, a 360 millimeter AIO can probably be found for maybe 150 to $200 right now, but that's still a significant extra cost when Ryzen CPUs have been able to get away with something like a 40 to $50 air cooler for quite some time. Because I've been using the H150i Elite LCD for my comparison testing though, I've used that as a baseline for my test today. So first off, I ran Cinemetch R23 with a 10 minute test in the H150i. Had a max CPU temperature of 84.9 with an average temperature of 83.8. So with that really nice cooler, we were not hitting 95C like we were hitting with parts like the 7950X. Our average CPU frequency during the test was 5.2 gigahertz, 5,218 megahertz. And we had a peak package power of 114.9, which is right about where it should be. Our score was 15,167, and then I also ran through my Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmarks just to see if changing the cooler was going to change gaming performance too. Our first contender for comparison CPU cooler is the Wraith Stealth. Not only is it the stock CPU cooler that came with the 5600X, but it's also like, almost free sometimes. It depends on how close you live to like a friendly neighborhood PC builder, but because these are often swapped out for higher end coolers, you can often find them for very low prices like five bucks, maybe 10 bucks on sites like eBay. So that brings our total cost up to only $310, a significant discount over that Corsair cooler. But what happens when we run Cinebench? We have an immediate temperature spike and this has been pretty well documented in the reviews that have come out so far. It jumps up to 95C or higher right away and then it immediately throttles the CPU frequency as well down to below five gigahertz. This gave a max CPU temperature of 95.9, an average of 95.3, and our CPU frequency was hit pretty hard, dropping down to 4,831 megahertz on average, which is almost a 400 megahertz decrease, which is pretty significant. The system was trying to keep the CPU in check by throttling not just a frequency, but also limiting the amount of power that it was able to use. Peak package power was 102.9 watts. On average, it was closer to around 87 watts, and that gave us a Cinebench R23 score 
of 13,999, a pretty significant drop from our score with the Corsair AIO. Only bright side here was the gaming performance really wasn't affected. We actually got a slightly higher frame rate of 230.2, but that's pretty much within typical variance. Same goes for the 1% lows, but we did hit 94.8 degrees peak CPU temperature during the game test itself. And that really shouldn't be happening because gaming shouldn't be hitting a CPU nearly as hard as something like Cinebench R23. Our next contender is the Wraith Spire, and this cooler came with higher end models like the 2700X, and there have been a few variants of this. One has a copper slug in the middle, and that's actually the nicer version. I wasn't able to scrounge up one of those though, so this is the Wraith Spire without the copper slug. These make up for that a little bit by having a higher RPM fan, but all the fans for the uh, extra cooler that I was using were set to run at 100% speed. And again, like the Stealth, you can often find the Spire for significant discounts, maybe 15 to 20 bucks, sometimes as little as $10 on sites like eBay, but I summed it up as a $320 cost. We once again hit 95 degrees pretty quickly after we ran the Cinebench R23 test, but it wasn't quite as quickly as it happened with the Wraith Stealth. We were also idling a little bit cooler, about 43 degrees Celsius, whereas with the Wraith Stealth, we were at 47 to 48 degrees. But we did again see that immediate throttling down to about 5.08 gigahertz with the Wraith Spire, and we ended up with an average CPU temperature of 95.2, just 0.1 degrees below what the Wraith Stealth got. But you can still see that it performed better because our average CPU frequency was right around 5 gigahertz, 5,002 megahertz on average, according to my results. And the system was also able to apply peak package power going up to 111 0.5 watts, average was around 97 watts. So again, we can see that the system was able to apply more power and get a little bit more performance out of the Wraith Spire. That resulted in a R23 score of 14,487. And once again, our Shadow of the Tomb Raider results were pretty much the same, 228 average frames per second. But the peak CPU temperature was much more reasonable at basically 80 degrees Celsius. From there, I decided to jump up to something a little bit more aftermarket. So we have the Be Quiet Pure Rock 2 FX. This is an air cooler with a single 120 millimeter fan. It's rated for 150 watt TDP CPUs. And this FX version has an RGB fan on it. And I must admit that I did plug in the RGB. So hopefully that didn't uh, affect the test results too much. This cooler usually retails for about 60 to $70, but the Pure Rock 2 non-FX, which doesn't have RGB, but is functionally the same otherwise, is typically about $45. So that's the price that I used today. And right away we can see improved performance. Idle temperatures are about 42 to 43 C, just slightly slightly cooler than the Wraith Spire. And when starting Cinebench R23, the temps immediately spiked, but they only got up to 89.8 degrees Celsius, staying out of the red, just barely, although it did creep up above 90 as the test progressed. Our max CPU temp was 92 degrees Celsius, our average was 91, and our average CPU frequency was back towards what we had with the H150i Elite LCD at 5,161 megahertz. And that's just about 50 megahertz shy. Peak package power was 115 watts, with the average being slightly below that, 113.5, and that is again pretty close to what the H150i Elite LCD was doing, and that resulted in a score of 14,858, which again is much closer to what we were getting with our CPU cooler that costs close to $300 by itself. So the Pure Rock 2 is definitely putting on a good showing in terms of bang for the buck. Once again, not much change in our Shadow of the Tomb Raider results, although again our peak CPU temperature is down to 73.4 degrees Celsius, uh, just two degrees or so above uh, what the H150i Elite LCD was doing. And that's where I was going to leave things, but then Ali from Optimum Tech posted this video where he did PBO2 tuning in order to get more performance and lower temperatures out of his Ryzen 7000 series CPUs, which I believe was the 7700X and the 7950X. I will link his video in the description, but it was a great reminder of some of the things you can do with precision boost overclocking, specifically PBO2, where you can set a negative voltage frequency curve. With my testbed board, which is an ASUS Crosshair X670E Hero, you just head over to the Advanced tab and then you go all the way down to AMD overclocking. From there, you need to accept that you're probably gonna blow up your computer and then go down to PBO, Precision Boost Overdrive. Set that to Advanced mode, then go down to the Curve Optimizer. We're gonna set that to all cores, do a negative offset, and then the value here can be set to between one and 30, basically. 30 is the maximum, which I plugged in and tested, and it just worked. So that's what I went with, but you can dial that back a little bit if you experience any instability and you're trying to do this yourself. After booting back into Windows, I ran Cinebench R23, and the results were actually quite impressive. It, we're basically getting free performance here. We're getting higher frequencies, as well as lower power usage and lower temperatures. So rather than immediately pushing temperatures up to 90 or above, we got to about 78 degrees Celsius, and I noticed we were hitting five 
5.35 to 5.4 gigahertz across all of our CPU cores. We are also doing this using less than the peak CPU package power going to 98 to 99 watts, and the results were a max CPU temperature of 82.4, average CPU temperature of 79.6, average CPU frequency of 5,370 megahertz, we hit 5.45 gigahertz peak, and again that package power barely got over 100 watts, which resulted in an even higher score than we got with the Corsair H150i Elite LCD 15,572, up from 15,167. It's a little too early to say if my 7600X is just a really good overclocker, or if this is something that most 7600Xs will be able to do, but it's definitely a setting you should enable if you invest in this platform. And again, that Optimum Tech video is linked in the description, and he goes into more details like setting the maximum temperature, which you can just manually do as well if you don't want your CPU to get over a specific temperature. But let's not forget that this is my 7600X review, and I have a bench of bunch marks to share with you too. To save some time though, I'll point out that all my test beds, comparison hardware methodologies, and settings are the same as in my 7950X video, so please check that video out for more details. I've also just recently received this box. Let's do a quick unboxing. Aha! Uh -huh. That had the other two CPUs I was missing, the 7700X and the 7900X, so I will be returning with one more video to bring these middle children into the fold as well, at which point I will be able to talk more about the entire stratum of CPU performance now that the 7000 series CPUs are out, which I will likely then have to update when the Intel Raptor Lake CPUs launch. There is much benchmarking still to be done, but for now, here are my comparison CPUs for today. As you can see, I've added the 12600K and 5600X alongside the 7600X. The details of my testbed setup can be seen on screen now, and for the rest of my benchmark slides, please enjoy this lovely music while I rest my voice. I extend my traditional welcome to everyone who just jumped ahead to the benchmark summary part. Here are my aggregate scores across all tests, starting with compute performance. I'm using the 5600X as the 100% baseline here to see how far we've come, and based on my tests, the 7600X provides about 25.3% more performance over last gen on average across my test suite. That's with about an 18% increase to power draw in Blender as well. So there is a trade-off, but it's not quite as bad as it was with the 7950X. Versus Intel's 12600K, the 7600X can't quite keep up due to its four-thread deficit. Those E-cores really make the difference for Intel here, and we're not even comparing to the 13th gen parts launching in October yet. Next is gaming. Basically, we're looking at the same values, just resorted, and here all the CPUs are staying within about an 18% lead over the 5600X. Again, please note that gaming performance can vary a lot between titles and game engines, and I'm only including six today, so further testing is warranted, but the 5800X3D is still holding its ground with a 3% lead over the 7600X. The 12600K, meanwhile, was about 10% slower for gaming in my tests, although it and the 5600X can be picked up for way less money than a Ryzen 7000 setup right now. Here's a final chart with pricing as well, because it helps to have it all on one page. I am using the current retail prices for existing CPUs, not MSRP, but if I may say it once again, I think there's more to be considered than just the CPU price. Here's another Another look at my rough estimate of the core platform cost for three of the setups I tested today, and personally I just don't think the $300 to $400 comparative upgrade cost is worth it for the performance you get right now with the 7600X. And that's even considering those PBO2 undervolting results. Ultimately, I think there's only one thing that will make the 7600X a palatable offering for gamers. Time. 
about a month specifically, to allow a few things to happen. B650 and B650E motherboards will be launching in October, which should bring some hopefully reasonable prices and a big drop in base platform cost. Intel's 13th Gen Core Raptor Lake CPUs launch October 20th, and if the 13600K is a performer, it could put some downward pressure on the 7600X's price. It would be nice to see a familiar AMD CPU discount like we used to have back in the old days take effect, which took way too long to happen last gen with the 5600X. And DDR5 prices are expected to continue falling, so that could shave some dollars off the value proposition as well. But for anyone trying to stick to a budget who doesn't insist on paying the premium for the newest and shiniest thing, I just can't recommend the 7600X at this time. But again, give it more time. Closing things to say, uh, hit those thumbs up buttons on your way out if you enjoyed this video. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for shirts, other cool stuff you can buy like my new 8-bit designs. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and stay tuned for tons more content coming soon. We're just getting started with launch season after all. We'll see you guys in the next video.